It is great to be in the house of the Lord again in America. <laughs> it was great. We, uh, many of you know, we had a, a fun time trying to get out of the country. We were in Texas, and uh, people kept coming to us, and they're going, "You came from Pensacola, then?" Man, they had record rainfall in Pensacola. We're like, "We know. <laughs> We've been there all day. We were there for the record rainfall." Um, we had a we had a mess trying to get to the country we were going. I'm sure many of you have heard this. And uh, we we got to Panama and got stuck in Panama. And then in Panama City, not Panama City Beach, Florida. <laughs> Panama City, Panama. And uh, we had to split the groups up. Someone got to go straight into Quito and to Ecuador. And we flew into Panama City, and there was no. Espanol among us, <laughs> and there was no English among them. So uh, we had to figure things out. We finally got out, and our flight had engine problems. About 30, 45 minutes into the flight to Quito, and it turned around and went back, and we delayed another two hours. So we got into Quito at four in the morning, and. On day two or three, we don't even know what a day it was. And uh, then we took a nine and an hour bus ride. That's about the distance. It's actually a little bit less from Jacksonville to Bonifay. But if you've ever been to Cherokee, North Carolina, when you ride through the mountains, it's that distance, but it's through the mountains. And you're wow. going around winding roads on the, with a bus who's passing people on curves. That's another story for another day. But uh, nine, nine hours later, we finally made it to our destination. And uh, a buddy Eric, he stole a line from uh, Spongebob. We were driving into town, he goes, three days later. <laughs> it was hilarious, perfect timing. As we drove in, everybody was laughing about it, but we got in there and we did some ministry. And we were joking about it, we said ministry was the easy part. <laughs> ministry was easy, Just we could cut the travel out, and everything else was great. Uh, but just a great time, over 450 kids coming from VBS and you say, well, this is a VBS, but these kids are walking two miles down a mountain by themselves to come to VBS and in that dark, they walk back home in the dark of the mountain, you know? And just from, I think one, one place we went, it was three uh, villages came together and the other place was six. And one of them was exactly two miles straight up the mountain. And those kids walk. And it would be like how we go to Ford every summer. They they have they have no events like that. So VBS, they come packing in. There was uh, on the last day over 450 kids there. And uh, this is one VBS stop out of six that they'll do this summer. So they go to six different locations. And before it's all said and done, they'll have over 2,500 kids that come to VBS. And they plant that seed of the gospel. And I'm telling you. They plant the seed, they cover it, they water it, they follow up, and it's just an amazing experience to get to be a part of it. Got to see the speed of light vehicles in action. Got to drive one of the Land Rovers at about 35 miles an hour around Mount Cliffs. <laughs> Thought, I'm not sending you any more money if you don't slow down. But um, it was a it was a great experience. And next week we'll I'll get them to do a couple of skits. I'm gonna be preaching again next week, and I'll have them do a couple of skits, and I'll show you a little slideshow, but. I was not putting that together last night. <laughs> I'm talking to Miranda last night. I'm trying to carry on a conversation and I kept falling asleep in the middle of talking. Just fall asleep and she just laughed at me. She's like, just a little bit. I was like, I can't, I gotta preach in the morning. I said, she's like, you're gonna be worthless, so it could have been. So um, but it's just great to be home and it's happy Father's Day. You know, happy Father's Day, fathers. Jeff, you said it well. You said it very well and you spoke the truth. Um, it's, you're under attack to be a father today. Every sitcom you watch, the father's the idiot. Yeah. You know, and, and, and we laugh at it, but, but it's, it's trying to tell you that the man is a fool, but God, what they're doing is trying to mock what God did. When he said, I want the man to be the head of the family. Of course, the world's against that, but. And we as fathers, we try to do our best. <laughs> Um, my father's actually here today. I'm so glad he's here. Uh, it's a great surprise on Father's Day. Um, we've learned, as you did, maybe maybe did you learn some many things from your father growing up? I've learned how to treat a woman growing up. 
and I did it. My dad embedded it in my mind. Every time that I would run in and wouldn't open the door, he'd be like, come out here. Sometimes I'd get a thump on the back of the head. And so I don't know if it's just that I love my wife so much or I'm afraid that my dad's going to pop it around the corner. I got to open it. I walk to the car door and I open it up. But you know what? I am grateful that he embedded that into me because, I mean, that's a, that's a great quality. Yeah. Man. And just a protective quality. Uh, I wasn't going to mention this, but... He, uh, he showed me about the rat hole. You, know? you may know where the rat hole is in your wallet. You stick that little extra money in there that you don't tell anybody about it when you need it. So, uh, so you ladies and your your husband does that. You go, what is? He goes, oh no, I just I don't know where. I just had this in my wallet for a long time. <laughs> We've been taught that growing up. But uh, it's great to have you here, Dad. Uh, we almost lost him a couple years ago. He was uh, he was electrocuted and he died. And it was a 270, uh, two, 277, that's what he said, he said, 277 sent me out, 270 brought me back. Um, and uh, the paramedic that was working on him said, he, and when he came to, he said, my shoulder. And the guy goes, thank God your shoulder hurts. <laughs> so it's, it's a great, that's a blessing. I know some of this, for some of you, it's a sad day. Your fathers are gone on to be with the Lord. And... Uh, telling you, God knows how you feel. He knows how you feel. And that love that they shared for you and having you is the love that He gave them. So you just remember that, you know, that love that they had is just a, a prayer away. It's, the Father has that same love. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it is right. It is a, it's a happy day, but yet it is a, at the same time, you know, we look back on Father's Day and we, we miss and we long our Father's book. Uh, some of you, though, you may be in here and you say, you know what, I didn't have a, I didn't have a good relationship with my father. There's some people in here who go, you know what, I don't know. If you were saying, if I was talking and praying about the father, you wouldn't know how to react to that because you don't know what that is. And I'm going to talk about that love today, the father's love. And, and I don't want you just thinking, of, hey, this is just a Father's Day message and he's going to do a couple points. But I want you to kind of go in here and, and just have a, a meeting with God this morning. You know, get in the presence of God and, and understand His love. So, if you would, let's just pray for me as we get started. And uh, let's, let's just cry out to Abba Father and have Him come in with the Spirit and, and touch our hearts this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love You. We love You, Daddy. What a great work You've done in our life. The Word says that You pulled us out of the miry clay. Set our feet on the rock and you established our buildings. But I pray that we would look at you not as somebody who's distant, not as somebody who rules with the iron rod, but somebody who's there that sent his own son Jesus Christ to die for us so we can live. I bless your name, Jesus. I bless your name, Father. Amen. Amen. The first point I want to bring up today is the Father's love. Many people have a misconception when we, we learn about the fall of Genesis. You know, Adam and Eve, Eve eats the, that, the fruit in the hands of Adam and eats, and they have, they're separated from God. And sometimes we have a misconception of who God is through that story because we kind of look at it and go, God is angry at us, and He doesn't like us too much. And, and there is an anger of sin. Because sin has caused some big problems. You know it in your own life. You can, you can look at the consequences of some of the sins in your own life and go, wow. <laughs> but God was never far away from you. Amen. Adam and Eve, God wasn't far away from them. It's immediately after they leave the garden, what does God do? He comes and teaches them. He comes in and, and back into their presence and begins to teach them and He gives them hope. He tells Eve, He says, look, childbirth is going to be hard. But the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the enemy. Amen. You begin already to, to put a thread in there. You begin at that point to say, I'm going to give you hope. In the New Testament, we know He says that I'll never leave you or forsake you. It was the same then. See, Satan took that, that, that when God said that, that the seed of the woman, what he did is he... Uh, Adam and Eve had Cain and Abel. What did he do? He got one son to bash the other son out, head out with a rock. He thought, I'm going to snuff this out right now. 
because he thought he meant their seed. And so God, like Abel, sacrificed and Cain got jealous and he murdered his brother and Satan thought he had him. And even though Cain did wrong, what did God do? He came in and he says, I know people are going to want to kill you for this, so I'm going to put a seal on you, Cain, and nobody's going to be able to touch you because I've marked you. Even in his failure. Right. People don't see that a lot of times. They think, well, he, God was angry and he sent him off. But he sent him off with something when no one could come against him and destroy him. And you can go, well, well Brother Chuck, there's a, there is a little story where God drowned everybody on earth. <laughs> I believe he was a little angry <laughs> when he drowned everybody on earth. But when I look at that story, when I read in the New Testament, it says that God waited patiently. In 2 Peter, he says, I waited patiently for them to turn their life around. He said that Noah preached righteousness and with the Spirit of Jesus, the New Testament says, that he, he preached righteousness and with the Spirit of Jesus. For was it 120 years? Was that how long he preached? Yes. God was trying to make a way. 120 Amen. years with the Spirit of Jesus and teaching righteousness. God was trying to get them to come in. He never leaves us or forsakes us. And just like I said with Adam and with Cain and with Noah, you know, all these things are shadows and types of someone that was to come. And the Bible uh, has what we call a crimson thread or a scarlet thread that runs through it. And that crimson thread is Jesus. It ties that whole book together. If you read the Bible, you know, if you if you're one of those ones that's read the Bible through in one year, you you, you kind of get the flow of the Bible. You can kind of see the main picture. And this is what the main picture is. It's Jesus, 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 Jesus. You see that picture coming through. See, because we look at it and we like, we see it as, you know, innocence, fall, law, prophet. You know, that's the way we look at it. We read book by book. But when you see the flow, it's Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. A crimson thread that runs through it. And it was the Father's thread of piecing it all together. He has a grand vision and plan for our life. The problem with us is uh, our DNA. <laughs> We're fallen. So if the mother's fallen and the father's fallen, their seed is fallen. We know that. We, we see things in our life in our regular DNA. Some of you are going, you know what? I'm bald-headed. Thank you, somebody. Right? Some of you are going, I'm short. Thank you, Uncle Lord. Dad, brother, sister, you know, whatever, you know, you're saying thank you. Somebody, I'm sure. Some of us are going, I'm fat, and we try to blame it on somebody. <laughs> uh, some of us we get cholesterol, high blood pressure, you know, I mean heart disease, and you're going, thank, thank you, somebody. Appreciate that, having that down. But that's that fallen nature. That's that that DNA that comes from us is 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 fallen, it's sinful. And as it's passed down. We pass things. We, that's why the Bible talks about generational curses. You know, you got people walking around there saying, "You know, my granddad was an alcoholic. My daddy was an alcoholic. I'm just an alcoholic, just like them." But they've missed the point. There's that there's that crimson thread that's through the Bible that changes all that. That's why the Bible says that's that's why your DNA, your flesh, is sinful and fallen. He says, "But my DNA." That's why Jesus, when he came, he says, "You." You must be born again. Amen. Think about that. You must be born again. Because the nature that you live in and your body that you're in, it can't be fixed. You must be born again because when you're born of what I have, there is no death. All right? He said, well, we still die. One out of every one person dies. So, you know, death is an epidemic. But if we're born again, Something happens to us. We're changed, the Bible says, from death unto life. Amen. And this was all the Father's plan. He's not far from us. Amen. When you guys, maybe you've sinned even after being a Christian, and you feel like, I'm far away from God. You've done something, you go, how can I do this and be who I am? This is a hard thing to understand. It's a hard thing to teach because what I don't want to do is give you a license to go do what you want to do. But here's, here's something I want you to get a picture of. God's going, I fixed it even before you did it. I've already given you a way out. 
But even if you fall, we have an advocate with the Father. The Bible tells us many things over and over again. Even if you slip up, God's not far from you. See, that's the thing. The mindset we do this, and look, I know there's a spirit of God is in us, and He's teaching us to live righteously in this life. That's what grace teaches us too. But there's a time when we do this. I mean, we've all gone through it, especially new Christians. We go through. They feel like I tried, man. I can't do this. I try to be good. I, I try to not dip or chew or date girls that do. You know, <laughs> it's just not working out. And we're missing the picture because it was that thread that was sown through the Word, the DNA of God Himself, and He's saying you got to be born again. You can't. You can't stay on the same track. But if you change, if your life's changed. I've done a great work in you. He says, nobody can take you out of my hand. Yeah. Nobody can come and take you out of my hand. See, in our DNA, it's like this. Uh, James 1, 13-15. says, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does He tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when? By his own evil desires. By his own DNA. By his own flesh. He is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, it gives birth to death. That's the truth, isn't it? We see it lived out. But then we see on the other side of it, Jesus says, when you come to me, you'll have life. And you'll have it more abundantly. He tells you this. He says, but don't think your life's going to be easy. He says, you follow me, there'll be trials and tribulations. He says, but fear not, because I have overcome the world. Because there's something about us when we take on His DNA, we get sewn into that fabric with that crimson thread. You know? That blood covering of Jesus. And what was so amazing about it was, it was a choice that Adam and Eve had to not listen to God. And it's the same choice that we have Amen. to receive Him back again. Isn't that awesome? It's this great picture. He's like, the same thing that killed you is the same thing that can set you free. That's right. And that sin drove you away, but it's that choice. He says, but you have a choice now for life. See, the Father had a vision the whole time. He said, I got Christ's blood to cover you, the Spirit of God in you, and that soul that God breathed into Adam and to create him. He says, I can bring them all back together. They were all destroyed by one choice, and all come back together again by one choice. Receiving my son Jesus Christ. You see, us as fathers, we have a we have our own vision. No, we 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 raise we raise our children. We, we want them to be healthy. You know, we want them when they grow up they get a good job. I mean, these are all good traits. We want them to be healthy. We want them to have a good job, make a good living. All right. We want them to settle down and have a family. You know, and take care of their family. And these are great traits. These are traits that God gives in, in our life. But God's main vision is this: that you're right with Him. That you're made right. His sole purpose is we'll take care of the wealth and the health and the family later, but first you've got to get your life right. My vision is that you'll be back on track with me. And so, fathers, you can understand this when you look in your children and you go, <laughs> you go, man, they they made it. <laughs> or, or maybe you, you, you have young children and you're going, Lord, please help me not to kill them for it. <laughs> It's that time. But the whole picture here in our heart, I want us to change the way we look at our children. Our thoughts should be this first, that they get right with God. Because listen, they'll get right with God no matter what they go through. They're going to be in His will and in His hands. Listen, I guarantee you, Keith Hall, our missionary, he, his dad didn't plan for him to live in Ecuador. Alright? Alicia, his wife, her dad, he told me, I definitely didn't see this coming. They told me it was going to be missionaries, and he said, I, he said, I bellered, 
and cried and weep and told them, don't do it. And he said, but my whole purpose in life was messed up. I wanted them to be where I could still see them and have a hand in their life and still help them along if I need to. And he said, but this is what he said to me. He said, but my vision was messed up. He said, if I was looking at what God wanted, they're in God's perfect will. See, because we can't look at tragedies like 9-11 and say, you know, that was God's plan for their life. <coughs> That's a hard question, isn't it? That's a hard thing to think about. Right. We look at that and we go, where's God in that? No. <coughs> we look at people who pass away at a young age and we say, where's God in that? And these things hurt us and these things give us confusion, but God's going, no, 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 you understand. The world has fallen, but I'm here. But there's people who died in 9-11 who are in heaven. Amen. There were people who, you know, we don't even know about who were witnessing and reaching out to people before they died. And you know what? We can't see that. We go, that's terrible. But God had a way of working things out. He had a way of fixing some people's issues. And it's a hard thing for us to answer, but the, the Father has a clear view. He has a clear vision of the way things are going. And the problem with us is we don't trust Him enough. Mom. That's a hard thing to take, isn't it? Like, I trust God, man. I trust Him. You know? Like we were saying in Sunday school, you know, we were like, God, I trust you. He's like, I want you to write that check. God, I don't know if you know what you're doing. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe you got that a little messed up. Maybe you want Him to write the check. Okay? You know what I'm saying? Sometimes we don't trust Him enough because He knows, He has a grand view of how things should go. And we try to look at things as they're right in front of us and He sees the beginning from the end. And if we'll stay on track, if we'll get right with Him, if we'll be born again, we'll begin to follow His teachings. Everything in our life, it may not work out the way we thought it would, but it will work out the way it was supposed to work out. The Bible says that Jesus, He can open up doors that no one else can open and He can close doors that no one else can close. Some of you are you're not you're not even from Bonifay. You weren't born in Bonifay. And yet you're here. And you're in church right now listening to me preach the gospel. Isn't that amazing? Amen. You're going, how did I get here? I'm out from Milton and uh, in Allentown. It's out in the country. And I come to Bonifay and there's not much difference, okay? Right? And I'm going, wow, man, I can't believe that. I'm in Bonifay. You see how the Lord orchestrated things and how doors closed, doors slammed shut, and doors opened. You know, the very family and the wife I've got now is a gift from God. But it's because I chose to go in His direction. I chose the path that He laid out for me. I said, all right, you're in control, not me. I'm tired of doing things with my own vision. I want your vision. I want the Father's vision. Yeah. Yeah. And I started seeing things differently. Yeah. You know, they say hindsight's 20, 20 You can look back and go, wow. Look at that. Look at it. I, I was a sinner from the word go, right? You know, you know what I'm talking about. Selfish. And some of you are going, I'm the same way. And God saved you by His grace and that crimson thread sewn you into the fabric of God, into the DNA. Think about how awesome that is that you're here right now listening to what I'm saying, being a part of the body of Christ. And maybe today you're out there and you're saying, you know what, I'm, I'm struggling with this. Because I'm still looking at my life going, what's my purpose? Why am I here? What am I doing? You know, And God's got that. The whole thing is, you've got to release some things in your life and say, I'm not in control of how things go anymore. What do you want me to do? And begin to react to what God tells you. Because you know what? Some things He's going to tell you are going to sound crazy. Amen. What if He tells you, you're going to change the world? You go, yeah, you know what, God, you probably shouldn't have told me that. I'm going to go over here and not even pay attention to you anymore because I am nobody. And you know what, you know what God will say? He says, that's good because out of nothing I created everything. That's right. Amen. You know, but we get this mentality that we, uh, we can't do what He says. There's some people in the Bible, you see it. David, he was anointed king before he stood before Goliath. Something inside him was going, you know what? I can't die today. 
because God has called me for something greater. And once we figure out that purpose that He has for your life, all right? Some of you are going, that's my problem, Chuck. I've been looking for years and I don't know my purpose. Maybe it's right in front of you. You just had to let go of your life enough to let Him be in charge because His vision, His hindsight is better than yours. That's right. Because His isn't 2020, it's perfect. Okay, you ever say 2020 is perfect? His is perfect. He sees things the way they're supposed to be. And sometimes we just got to take a step back and say, all right, God, I've been doing this, 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 and this. And I've gotten nothing. Some of you said, you have chased the dollar all over the world and I've got nothing to show for it. God says, all right, good. Come to me, all you that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest because what you need is not probably work, probably what you need is rest. Yeah. You know, there's certain things going on in your life that He's going, you know what, if you hand that to me, I'll, I'll fix it. I'll break it. I'll break the greediness you have in your life. I'll, I'll break that sinful attitude. I'll, I'll get rid of it. But I need you to step back. I need you to release because I can see things better than you can. The Bible says that when we begin to follow Him that He gives us a ministry. The Bible says that He gives us a ministry of reconciliation. You know what that is? That is a ministry of getting, helping people get right with God. He says people are they're dismembered. They're outside the membership of God. They're outside of the body of God. He says, I don't want you to go and reconcile them. Now that you're saved, He says, now that, that you're a you're soul man, He goes, I'm going to give you another vision. And that vision is to reconcile with you. Uh, Mark 16, 15 says it this way. You look up on the screen. It says, He said, and it'll go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Go. Preach, reconcile people. Tell them about me. Uh, this is a kind of. I, I got on the plane this weekend. You know how preachers always have plane stories. They set some by somebody and delivered them, and it happened. Um, I, I sat by people and I talked to them about Christ, and they were saved. They actually had some amazing stories themselves. Uh, and some of them went on the trip. Some of them I didn't know they spoke English, and I just started talking English, and they answered me back, and I was like, yes. and some did not. <laughs> And uh, so I didn't get to witness to those folks. But I got to share the gospel with people. And, and uh, a majority of them were Catholic that I talked to. And uh, they were sharing with me things about how God had changed their life and, and about how they read the Word of God. And I was able to help them out. And they were like, you know, one of them was like, I'm young in the faith, but I love Jesus. You know, and they're like, and they kind of asked me, what's some advice you have? <laughs> yeah, ask a preacher. What kind of advice he has about the Bible? So for the next four hours, I told him about the advice that I had about the Bible, and they took notes, so at least they made me feel better um, about that. But there's something about that when you begin to share the gospel, right? Don't you feel closer to God? Don't you feel closer to Him? Because you know what? There's something Godlike about sharing His love. Because that's what He's done. He's taken that crimson thread that Jesus Christ and sown Him into the Bible. And when you look into that Bible, it says love. I look into Revelation and people go, Revelation is crazy. Chris just taught a series on Revelation. But you know what Revelation screams? Love. This is your last chance. Your last chance. You're like, one, two, three. That's what God's doing in Revelation. He's like, get, get right. Get right. Get right. It's the last chance. Just like I did with Noah, I'm giving you a last chance. It's love. It's changed our perspective on the way things should be. When you go on a mission trip, you always have a perspective change. You know, a lot of it's just like, you know, we're school rot. And you know what I'm saying? And America's got all this stuff. But I mean, like when I got back, I ran to the counter. I was like, I want a Starbucks coffee and a Dr. Pepper. You know what I mean? I need something right now. And so I know we're full, but there's a perspective. You, we had these missionaries that are out there, and listen, we brought them stuff, but they were so giddy over a bottle of barbecue sauce. You know what I mean? I mean, they're like almost tears. They're like, you know, Keith was like, beef jerky! You know? You can't get this over here. You don't eat the beef jerky over here. You know? It's a guinea pig. You know? And just to see them and their families come together, and you're like, wow. 
and them going and sitting in people's houses, preaching the gospel around the table, and going to the next place. And they go, man, there's something godlike about this. There's something going on. They've left everything. They have abandoned everything and followed the Father's vision. And now they're effective. They're in another country and they're effective. Like I told you, we were there at one or two stops out of six more they're doing. And we saw 450 kids. You, you know, these are two spots. I mean, we took all day to get to those places. So you know how much work they put into it? And you see it, you go, know, wow. And you feel ashamed. But I come back and God says, you know what? I'm on the plane. I'm just praying. I'm talking to God. Because I'm like, I, I, you know how everybody has those wow moments, you know, when they go on the trips. And I really didn't have a wow moment. I'm just going, I knew what to expect. I knew what was going to happen. I didn't know it was going to rain that much in Pensacola. But everything else, I kind of knew what was going to happen that way. And I'm going there and He says, you know what I want you to do? He says, I want you to not be so busy on things that aren't important. Because I'm busy all the time. And he says, but I, I don't want you to be busy on things that aren't important. He said, because they're not important. He says, think about the time you have and the time I've given you. He says, and follow my vision. He says, still trying to find stuff to fill the extra time you have? He says, just spend it hanging out with family. Just spend it sharing my gospel. He says, because that's where my vision is for you. It's in the relationship. It's in the process. So, I mean, we all go through things like that, but we get a perspective. You know, next week we're going to tell, I'm going to let some of the guys tell some stories, and you'll get a little bit of perspective of them. what happens. I mean, they'll be able to tell you, and they'll be telling them from their heart. You still probably won't see it the way they saw it because you weren't there. But you have a story too. The Bible says we've, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, Amen. His testimony, right? That what He did in our life is so powerful because each one of you, you have a vision of who you were and you have a vision of who you are. And that vision, that clarity that God's given you, you go tell somebody, yeah, look, maybe somebody, maybe you had an addiction problem. You said, yeah, I had an addiction with this, this, and this. And you're dealing with somebody who had an addiction. You said, but God set me free. Amen. Because you know, they're looking, they're looking for somebody to tell them God set them free because they're going, I can't get free. They need somebody to say, God set me free. Maybe you had other problems. There's all kinds of things. But God set you free. And you're able to help them. Leah. Yeah. Leah. She went through a tornado. She went through all these things. Disaster happened to her. She's in disaster relief. You know what she's doing? She's helping somebody. Yeah, with a testimony that she has. The blood of the Lamb and the word of the testimony. She's going, God did this for me. I thought it was the end. But I saw the light at the end of the tunnel. And she's able to sow that crimson thread into somebody else's life. He said, go into all the world and preach the good news. In this scripture, Philemon 1.6, if you can memorize something, write it down. It's something so powerful. Philemon's only one chapter. You can read the whole book if you want to. It's not very long. But this verse just keeps jumping out at me. It says, I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith. And it doesn't just leave you there. He says, so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. He says, there's something different about it. There's something godlike about when you step outside of your shell and you begin to preach Jesus. You see things, the world, differently. Because you're not worried about you. You're not focused on you. You begin to be focused on what His vision for your life is. So some of you are going, I don't have a vision. Go back to Mark chapter 16, verse 50. If you don't have a purpose and a vision for your life, I'm fixing to put it up on the board. That's it. Go. Go. Go preach the good news. Go share the gospel. If you're going, I don't know what God's purpose and plan for my life is. That's it. Jesus said, this is the purpose and plan for your life, basically. Amen. Go. Go tell them what I did. Go back to the next Scripture. Because when you do that, when you do that, Mark 16, 15, He says, when you share your faith, when you're active in it, you'll have a full understanding. 
That's why people, when they come back from mission trips, they're able to see things a little bit different because they've been out sharing their faith. They've been out doing this very thing and they see things differently. It doesn't matter where you go. It doesn't matter if you go to Germany, if you go to a third world country. When you're sharing your faith, you see things differently. Because you don't look at people as like, look at that guy. You know, he's smoking a cigarette in the church yard. You see him different. You go, wow. You begin to look at things in another, another lens and you go, I don't even worry about that. I want to know if he's right with God. Amen. I want to know if he is my focus is on where His heart is. Because when we do this, we kind of get to that next level with Christ. Because then He says, alright, you will share my faith. you will do something even bigger. you will do something with the money you don't have yet. you will do something because you believe me and you trust me and I'll be able to fulfill that vision I have in your life. You'll be able to change the world. You'll be able to be who knows? You may be able to be a missionary. You don't know it now. You're going. You pray every night. You're like God bless me, drag me on, guide me, show me, lead me, help me. Don't let me be a missionary. You know that thing. You know, don't send me to Africa, please. You know, <laughs> I'll do anything for you except. And then he sends you there. You know. But when we get in His vision, and His plan, there's a scripture, and I want to leave with this one right here. It's uh, Proverbs twenty-two six. You've all seen this before, right? It's Father's Day. Right? Train a child in a way he should go. And when he is old, he will not turn from it. I think he needs to depart from it. A lot of people get this and going, I taught my kids right. I put them in. Look, they still fall away from God. I don't understand. He says, just train them in the way. Right? You can't get them saved anyway. The same choice that destroyed them is the same choice they can make to set them free. Yeah. Your job as parents, fathers, is to train them in the way. You train them the way they should go. I thank my father. He took me to church and he trained me the way I should go. Ah, doesn't mean I was a good kid. Doesn't mean I was a good teenager. It's terrible. You know? I did all kind of crazy stuff. But you know what? Every time I thought about it, I remembered the way. Yeah. When I would lay down on my bed at night, I would think about the life I was living. You know what I remember? I remember the way. So when I knelt my knee down and gave my life to the Lord, you know what I did? I made a choice to follow that way. And look at me right now. I'm preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. I never would have thought that. But all I did was make the choice to say, God, you're in control of my life. You know? I may not even make the choice to begin with for the right reason. I may be like, you know, I like this girl and she's a Christian. Maybe if you let me marry her, <laughs> I'll do what's right. You know? But maybe it was like this. Maybe you got saved because you didn't want to go to hell. You know, me and him was in Sunday school and the teacher's talking about heaven and she's like, man, in hell, the people burn and play. You go, I'll sign me up for the heaven. Where can I get on that one? Yes, I'll be baptized. But there comes a point in our life when accountability comes in and God says there's this choice and there's this choice. There's life more abundantly and there's the things that you want your way. There's a life that you want to live your way. He gives us that same choice. He puts that fruit right in front of us. And he says, I want you to choose because that's when you really love. It's when you choose love. God isn't going to make you a robot. He isn't going to make you do something that you don't want to do. He's going to set it in front of you and say, you know, I set before you two choices. Life and death. And he says, oh, that you would choose life. Yeah. That's the God we serve. Yeah. So this morning, some closing. God has set before some of you in here. Maybe you're, you haven't been in the church in a while. Maybe you're not right with God. God set in front of you two choices. Life and death. There's another scripture that says, I set before you two choices and I've called all of heaven to watch your response to these choices. Do you know you have the attention of heaven this morning? They're watching us and they're saying, what are you going to choose? Life or death? Oh, that you would choose life. 
if you would bow, if you would stand and bow your heads. The Father has sown in your life a crimson thread. There have been people that's been in front of you. There have been people that's contacted you, and they've sown a crimson thread in your life. And if you're here today and you say, "I have never accepted Jesus as my Savior. I've never given my life to Him," the choice is there. He says, "Life." Or death. Oh, that you would choose life. So if you're there and you say, you know what, I don't know Jesus, but today I want to get my life right with Him because I know His love is perfect. Maybe I don't understand the Bible. Maybe I don't understand the things in my life, but I, I believe something inside of me, there, there's like a spirit inside of me rising up telling me that's the truth. The Bible says that is the Spirit of God. He says that you won't get saved apart from it because He's drawing you. See, the Father isn't far away from you. He's there. He's drawing you. He's pulling you close. And if you say, I don't know Jesus, but I don't want to go another day without Him. I want to choose life. If you would, just slip out of your seat and come to the front. Don't be ashamed of the Gospel. It's the power of God to change your life. into it. The choice is there. The next thing is this, and I'm not going to give an altar call for this, but the next thing is this. Maybe God's telling some of you today, just let go of your life. You've given your life to Him, just let go of your life. Quit holding on to things. Just let go and let God live through you. Quit holding on to certain areas because God says, if you give me your life, I'll use you to change the world. I'll use you to preach the good news to all creation. In any way he sees fit, he'll work his purpose out of your life. So I'm going to pray for you. You guys can pray for each other. If you want to just lay a hand on somebody, begin to pray. Just pray, God. I pray that we give everything up to you. I have no control of my life anymore, God, but you have complete control. You lead me in what I should do, Father. Now, Father God, right now, we just praise your name. I pray that we begin to seek the life. I, I, I pray that we begin to seek the truth with our whole heart. And there's things in our life, Lord, that we're issues we're dealing with. I pray we release them today. I pray we let go. Because, God, how can we receive from you if we have hands clenched? But if we're released with open hands, we can receive from you what you have, God. We can give and we can receive. What I pray right now, that those things that we're dealing with, we put them under the blood of Jesus Christ. And we go and tell our testimony. Because we are overcomers, God. There's no, there's no need for us to stay defeated or stay down or depressed or brokenhearted. Because the gospel is the power of God that gives people salvation. Would I pray right now that we would overcome our fears because He hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Let us give our anger right now, God, because happy is He whose God is the Lord. Let us receive the joy of our salvation. Some of us need to get our joy back in here. God, you replaced the fruit of Adam and Eve with the fruit of the Spirit. And now we can have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and goodness, and gentleness. God, we can have all those things that you've given us that we couldn't have unless we give our life to you. I pray for the fruit and the gifts of the Spirit within this church, God. And we give you all the glory and acclaim. Happy Father's Day, God. We love you.